Hey everyone, welcome to Mean Machine Talks. I am back. It's been a very well since I've done a podcast. However, uh, I have a very special guest, as always. However, this one is, um, I would say, a little bit more special. Not only can he sing, but he also has a plethora of knowledge when it comes to gaming as well. Rick Waller was uh, well known in the UK uh, for his beautiful singing voice and has done some excellent covers of songs but also has some excellent ideas when it comes to remakes of games, which we'll be touching on soon. So, please welcome Rick Waller. How are you? Hello, sir? hello. Yeah, I'm not too bad. Not too bad. Very, uh, very happy to be here. Good. Yeah. Likewise. It's um, it's a bit odd how our paths crossed. Um, it, it isn't every day I can say I've had a uh, what I would say a. a I guess I can call you a celebrity, can't I? A minor celebrity. Oh, t- twenty years ago, maybe. <laughs> a tw- a twenty. Well, well. To be fair, I was on TV about twenty years. No, would it be? No, it's more than twenty years ago. Blimey, uh, ninety-four. Yeah, it was well over. Blimey. Years. Yeah. Crikey. Um, yeah, I was only I was only a smaller boy then. At, uh, games <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's strange how our paths would cross. I was on the uh, Retro Gaming Revival podcast, and your mm. your name cropped up, and um, here we are. Here we I, are. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm sat here with a man that can do karaoke and professional singing a lot better than I can. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not asking to sing. So it's it's all about fun. It's all about fun. <laughs> At the end of the day, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good you are or anything. It's just about having fun. You know, you could be the worst. I'm one of the worst gamers ever, but I still enjoy playing oh, games. Like I, I think I might take that trophy away from you. You've been no, present to actually, in my streams. So. Yeah, to, to be fair, to be fair, um, I had a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, what do they call it? An epiphany last year when uh, when Elden Ring came out, and uh, I'd never touched a Souls like game before, so I went in Elden Ring. I got it for my fiance because she really wanted to give it a go. And I got hooked on it myself, and uh, it's it's certainly a steep learning curve that um, really uh, really throws you in there quite hard. But um, yeah, the the Souls games have a certain um, flavour of stress, I would like <laughs> to call it. Um, I played what was it? I think it was the Dark Souls remake on stream. Yeah, um, and a lot of my viewers at that point had actually played many different souls games of varieties it was my first attempt and yeah i think they bet whether i could beat the first boss and strangely <laughs> i did it and then literally walked around a corner some guy just like tonked me on the head and i was dead yeah I was like, so absolutely hang on a minute. so hang on a minute the boss i defeated and this random dude just runs up and shanks me on the head yeah, something it, seems completely unfair about all this <laughs> makes no sense does it when you can you can absolutely absolutely destroy a boss and then and then die on the trash. It's, uh, but I think that's the I think that's the, the beauty of the Souls games. Hmm. You know, it's it's the fact that everything is completely. You know, there's no rules or anything. If you see it, it can kill you. Indeed, yeah, that is the thing. I I, I was actually looking at some of the scenery sometimes, wondering if just a random boulder, <laughs> yeah. a random boulder out the sky, just Zeus is like, no, not today. And I'm like, oh, why do you hate me today? So. It's that it's that classic uh, it's that classic RPG, um, <laughs> the uh, the stroppy game master, that like boulder yeah. boulder falls, you die. Yeah. Oh, you're dead. Start at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we, we have diverted slightly, but uh, we will touch back onto Elden Ring because I think that's an interesting uh, point to, to get to. So, um, as I do with most of my guests, I, I like to do what I like to call a bit of a rewind on their life. And, yeah. Um, obviously, you have a, uh, a rather interesting uh, tale to tell, that's for sure. Um, some good, some not so good. Um, yep. <laughs> which which we'll, we'll briefly touch on. But... But but concentrating on the gaming side, what, what was kind of your earliest gaming memory, and and what was your first kind of computer console that you owned? Right. Okay. So thinking back, the I think the first I don't even really if you call it a console, but the first gaming experience I had, uh, my brother had an Atari eight hundred XL. Nice. With uh, Donkey Kong, Pole Position, Caverns of Mars, uh, some absolutely cracking games um i started uh started to play on that when i was about three 
kind of got the hang of that Galaxian as well. Um, and then for my fifth birthday, my dad got me the Atari 2600. It was my own, it was my own first, my own first computer. Yeah, and I had, I had Pele Soccer. I had, um, oh God, what was it called? Adventure, was it? Yeah, yeah, adventure. The one, the one with the different coloured dragons, and yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah, and my one of my best friends at the time had ET. Controversially, it's a game I absolutely loved at the time. I didn't know what I was doing, but it was just weird, <laughs> and I loved it. Um, it was. Um, it, do you know what? Every time I see videos of it, I, I do feel a little bit. What's the word? Um, I feel like it gets a little bit of a, a bad rap because of obviously the historical yeah um, the story behind it. But the one thing I will say is the pixel art graphic of ET, given the palette <laughs> and the lack of pixels, actually is quite good. That's the yeah. only thing I will say. Yeah, it's it's. If you wanted ET, you got ET. If you wanted a decent game, that's not what you came here for. <laughs> no, but it was. I think anything based on a, a, a film like E.T. at the time, even if they'd spent years making it, mm. I just don't think the technology was there to really make anything more than just uh, have a little sprite moving around, collecting objects. Because most of the games in the early 80s were have a little object, moving around, collecting things, and that was it. You know, it wasn't until we saw like consoles like the Master System and the Nintendo come along where there was a little bit more a little bit more detail to them mm-hmm. where you're able to say, Oh, that's that sprite there is actually that that's a that's a, like a proper person or that's you know, it it, it just it was it was a like a, a big step from from Pong to um like the early consoles. Mm. No, I, I agree with that. I think one thing that always surprised me, I guess, with the the early Atari consoles is the um, the focus on line graphics. And what I mean by that is if you go back and play something like uh, Missile Command, mm. in essence, all of it is is line drawings. And then, you know, you see a line go up, which then creates more lines. But you kind of build that the rest of the picture you use in your mind. And it's funny you may mention the 800 XL because one of my favorite games of all time on there is uh, Rescue on Fractulous, um, which is a LucasArts game um, where you've got like a ship and you go around rescuing uh, people. And as they come along, they knock on the cabin. And if you don't open it in time, they die. Or you may end up with an, an alien that sort of ends up in the yeah. interface. But, but all of that was line drawing. And even though it had a frame rate of about two um (laughs) you kind of built again a lot of that in your head and uh, i think that's where a lot of the beauty of old games especially in those days kind of had its it it, it was pleasurable to play because a lot of it kind of came from your own mental creativity Mm. you know you kind of had if a game didn't have enough color palettes you kind of built the rest of those colors in your head and and so on and so forth and those particular line line drawn games, as it were, um, were, were some of my favourites. And even when I think of things like recently, I've, I've just, well, me and my brother have just um, helped fix a, or repair a uh, Vectrex that I got. And all of that is is vector line graphics. And mm. when you see what you can do with just lines, it, it's fantastic. So, um, yeah, th- there's a lot to be said about, and I've said this more times than I would <laughs> want to repeat uh on this podcast but i've always said if you give yourself a reduced um uh, kind of schematic of what you're designing for rather than just an open palette where you know you can go and open unity or whatever and just build this Mm. amazing game with nothing but if you actually restrict the amount of you know color palette and the amount of pixels you've got and things like that i've always said it always breeds more creativity and i've always said that games that were made maybe even the, probably the Mega Drive ga- days and the SNES games, I think up until that point, were probably at their creative m- highest point because the technology was holding it back. And mm. there were so many clever ways people got around switching colour palettes and, and sprites and things like that. And I just feel at that point when it tipped over to the kind of PlayStation N64 era, 
there was so much more available 3D spaces and polygons and things like that, that that level of creativity really just disappeared in an instance. And it's it's such a sad thing. But yeah, the 300 XL, uh, uh, sorry, the 800 XL really has a uh, a bit of a bit of love for me. That's for sure. <laughs> I've got a lot of love for that thing. Oh, the, the other game. Um... I'm trying to think of oh, I can't I can't remember what it was called now, which is really embarrassing because it was one of my favourite games. You're like in a spaceship and you had to warp through space and find these spaceships that you had to destroy and stuff like that. And I, um, you had to like go into warp speed and hunt things down. And oh, I can't well, think of what it was well, called re- now. Res- Rescue and Fractulous had had warping mm. things in it, but I don't think you hunted other ships i think you only just went to different planets to pick up the the guys that you had to rescue but um yeah but again i i i've always said i think probably quite controversial i've always had a soft spot for the for the 800 xl because i just think it was the perfect blend of the right amount of tech with the right amount of creativity yeah and it just, <clears throat> and it just allowed the tipping point for someone's um creativity in their mind to really make make the stories come to yeah life. i mean it's like you you had these you used to be able to buy these books of coding mm. where you'd like put in these like 10 go to go yeah. sub 40 60 and stuff like that and you'd be able to put all these inputs in you'd be able to make these tiny little simple programs that you'd spend hours typing out and they'd last maybe three seconds as soon as you pressed yeah. a button but you were so proud of yourself for having spent the time to actually do it and make something flash on the screen or something. And that was, that was amazing. <laughs> it was yeah, so I, simple. Uh, I, I remember my, my father going through that, um, what I would call minor hell. Um, mm. I mean, as a, as a, a web programmer by day, um, having so many debugging tools to my, my, my hands now where I can literally just put a piece of script in. And it's like, you forgot a semicolon here, or, you know, you forgot a quotation mark here. Back then, if you hit run and it just went error, you'd go, oh, and then you'd have to go sit like digit by digit trying to find it. it was mm. like, that's the semicolon I missed. And then yeah. all of a sudden it works. And four hours later, as you said, something flashes on screen, you go, ah, it was all worth it. And then you power it off and go, <laughs> never to be seen again. So. Mm. <laughs> but but those were the days, right? You know, Or you'd get right the, to the end and you'd have a power cut. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I felt that one. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything worse, to be honest. I think I'd rather sit there and look at semicolons rather than a power cut. But anyway, I don't rest. Um, but that, that's that's interesting. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting path to go into because I think the Atari brand really injected itself into so many homes. And mm. uh, especially in, in my household, um, I firmly remember the, the 2600, the 800XL definitely being uh, uh, a, a firm favourite in my household, although it used to uh, annoy my mum. My dad used to play Space Invaders at uh, <laughs> uh, at night, and all she should hear is, dad, 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 dad. And yeah, if I do that noise around her now, I can see like the, the fear just rise up out of her. So uh, that's that's always a good laugh. So, um, so was it was it just yourself? You said your brother was was with you as well. Is that right? Yeah. Um, basically, I was the I was the extreme youngest of three. Uh, both my brother and sister were like ten years older than me. So by okay. the time by the time I was really coming up to playing games, they were they were already teenagers. Right. So um, so I, I I kind of got a lot of good hand me downs mm. and. But I also had to, also had to kind of like struggle a bit to try and get to play on them because, of course, my brother being a teenager, kind of like, oh, yeah, I want to want to play on me Atari, and I'd be like, oh, can I have a game? So, um, no, no, it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it was. I think I think my brother was just mad at me because I, you know, as like a three, four year old, I very quickly became just as good as him, <laughs> and I don't think he liked that. Although yeah, my sister, I... my sister was an absolute master of Galaxian. Um, she uh, on the on the eight hundred XL Galaxian, you'd get to the point where about fifty levels in, it's like everything would just disappear. It was oh, like yes. it, yeah, all the graphics right. would disappear, and you'd yeah. just see the individual Galaxians as they were coming down, and it was like, wow. 
You know, I'd uh, never seen anyone get so far in a game that it just, uh, in my mind, it had just stopped working. It had just like, it was a bug or something. I'd, I'd truly don't know to this day if that was something that was intended just to make it harder or, or I, I what, think, but I, it was I, uh I remember reading brutal. about that. I'm pretty sure it is something where the, the sprites do disappear and they suddenly become like invisible. But mm. um I didn't even know it had fifty levels, so that's uh, something I just It might not have been about fifty. It's it was it was a lot. It was a it was an awful lot. She'd spent ages playing it to get to this to like the invisible level. And I think, I was just um, in um, awe. What was the other game? Um I think Space Invaders had something like that as well, when you got besides a per, a particular um, level. I think all of the the invaders disappeared, and you were basically mm. shooting into the ether, hoping you were going to nail something. I think most people would probably get quite close to it, but I think if you got down to like the last five invaders, you just you wouldn't have a chance. So. Mm. Or maybe I just really suck at space invaders. Which is I used to go so fast <laughs> as well. They just like it, it was like little, just little tiny. It was like streaks across the st- screen. You couldn't exactly. actually see anything. You needed it's a higher like... hertz TV. That's what you needed. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Modern tech fixes things again. Um, so so that was your first, I guess, um, kind of you know, gaming console. Did, did you have a, a PC when you grew up? How, how... No, absolutely not. My okay. first PC um, was, let me think, I was probably about 13 or 14 when I had my first PC. Okay. And my my uncle Roger, who wasn't my uncle, is my dad's best friend, but you know, uncle, uncle. Yeah. Um, yeah. He um, he was uh, he was an engineer um, living yeah. out in uh, living out in Dubai, and all the like the, the Middle Eastern countries doing like engineering for like, it was like Dubai, Brunei, Saudi all that kind of place and he was you know he had his hands on absolutely everything and he gave me one of his old computers and just remembers like first time switching on a pc and it was like oh this is <laughs> this is different gravy this is uh it is <laughs> this is a bit special until then i'd you know i'd, I'd gone from having uh, an amiga 600 to oh, okay all of a sudden having a PC that was considerably more powerful. Wow. And it was like, ooh. <laughs> how, uh, how long did you have the 600 for, just out of interest? Um, I got that for passing my 11 plus. Um, nice. So that would have been my 11th birthday I got that for. Right. So uh, by the time I got the PC, as I, it was about two and a half, three years. Um, I never had a lot of luck with the Amiga. Um, mm. the, a lot of the ports had problems always having to take it to go and be like welded to have new ports in there so i could actually use my mouse or my joystick um it was really interesting trying to find a way to use um to use the keyboard to control games that really weren't designed for that it's it's, it's weird to think that <clears throat> back then uh, like a computer actually had a proper keyboard you hardly any of the games allowed you to, to do it with WASD. That yes. The only thing I could ever play on that was Civilization, which <laughs> became my like my go-to game for probably about a year. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Civ was, Civ was actually a, a really great ad- addition to that. In fact, what was the game? I was, I was talking to a couple of colleagues about this the other day. Damn it, I'm trying to remember now. Um, it may have been Civilization, actually. Um, God, blimey, that's that's really caught me off guard now. But yeah, there, there was um, <laughs> another top down, a top down. Oh, it might have been Sim Sim City, I think. Actually, all right. Okay. Um, the original Sim City. I'm pretty sure that's right. It was like a, it it, it was very basic, but it but it mm. ran surprisingly well on the Amiga. Um, at least I thought it did. Anyway, um, but yeah, again, it, it when I showed people kind of what it was before compared to what it is now um you know th- that whole change of evolution of 3d graphics and then hmm. some of the sim cities i can't remember which version it was you actually were able to get like a physical car you could drop and then drive around your own city and stuff like that but then when you look at the original you go how the hell did you go from this to this yeah <laughs> 
how mm. but um but again I, I think a lot of that comes down to the mental creativity and when you are looking top down on a city you kind of build the i guess the the picture in your mind of how this whole thing is going to come together right Hmm. I mean, it's it's like anything. You you look at something basic and you think to yourself, "I wish that was, I wish that was a little bit better. I would, I'd love to see that in three D, or I'd love to, you know, more detail on that." And you know it, that it's uh, the whole thing about creativity is taking something that you love and wanting to make it better. I think you know you, you take you, you'll always take um, inspiration from somebody else. And then think to yourself, I can, I, I could do that better. I could have all these ideas to, for making something that could that could be better. And I suppose that's uh, kind of where a lot of my this this whole thing about obviously with with RGR started up this special part of the show called Waller's Remasters, <laughs> and it was a case of things that have have had such an impact on me personally that I would love to see somebody get their hands on them and make them into the glorious spectacles that had they been made 20 years later, they would have been. The, the top, the top games are on the market. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit later because mm. I, I have a funny feeling we, we are in a Renaissance period of gaming. And I mentioned this might've been on, podcast i'm trying to remember now the us in games right now i think the genre that has had probably the biggest renaissance in terms of rejuvenating a genre is probably the side scrolling beat em up hmm. um if you think of things like street fighter 4 uh, sorry um streets of rage 4 when that yep. got announced i mean that came completely left field but hmm. the 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 seismic shift in the gaming industry swiveled everybody's head around and went what yeah and everybody they know it's going to be rubbish it isn't going to be as good as the original and stuff like that but then you kind of have to take that step back and say well okay it's going to be its own thing what are they going to do with it and from that we've had what the the turtles turtles game. yeah but final vendetta is a fantastic side scrolling beat em up um and there are just so many that have now just exploded out of nowhere. It, it comes I'm really in. Hoping, yeah, I'm really hoping that there are other genres that, that go down this same route hmm. of rejuvenating these these old um, kind of genres that have been thrown away through 3D graphics, as it were. Yeah, it, it comes in waves, much like you know the the, the retro gaming. Um, uh, the whole craze about that is, you know, it's, it's something that, like I say, you look at something that you absolutely loved and you think to yourself, I loved it, but what if I could make it better? Hmm. You know, take something that is absolutely sacred to you and be like, let's make this the best it possibly could be. Um, obviously you've got two sides to that. You know, you'll obviously have the people who are like, never touch the originals. You know, they, they are absolutely sacred. And then other people who are like, actually, I'd really love to, this is the kind of game I'd love to play again for the first time. And, you know, go back in time and have those same, same kind of feelings and everything. And you do get new games that are absolutely incredible that have all that feeling of the old games and evoke those same kind of emotions and mm. it's it's just something that's really good to see because you know old ips and old uh, old concepts that at the time were probably held back a lot by the fact that we didn't have the kind of technology that mm. um that could get that absolute perfect game out of them and now we've got that and it's like going back to as I say going back to something that you absolutely loved and thinking you let's use the technology we've got now to make it as we remember it or maybe what yeah. it should have been back in the day I think the the devil's advocate in me and and this is through some of the things that I've seen there there are people who would pick up IPs and do what I would say is a good 
replication or, or remix or, or whatever you want to call it of that particular title. But there's a cup. There's one that sticks out in my mind very clearly until this day. It's probably one of the most disappointing remixes or remakes I've ever experienced, and and that game is Gods. Um, mm. originally released on the Amiga and, and uh, the Mega Drive, and I think it was on the Snares and a few others. And the Bitmap Brothers version till this day is probably one of the most cleanestly designed games in terms of its pixel art and the graphics. It just mm. it just has this this mm about it. It just looks so clean and done really precisely and stuff, especially if you get into some of the latter stages. And uh, funny enough, my um, tutor at university was the guy who did the music for it, a guy called oh, John okay. Fo- John Fox, uh, have a look at his credits when he starts up. And um, yeah, he used to be the original lead singer of Ultravox uh, before Midge. Oh. Um, and he left and, and Midge came in and uh, got all the money. Um, but anyway, that's, <laughs> that's, that's just the way. Yeah, it, I'll, um, I'll, I'll come on to that. Uh, that's another discussion for another day, I think. But I remember on the Switch, they announced um, there was a remake of Gods or a remaster of Gods coming. And I thought. Okay, I'm I'm up for this because the Bitmap Brothers have got quite a few game titles that I've always loved. Gods being one, uh, Chaos Engine, Magic yeah. Pockets, because yeah. because basically if I do that, I look exactly the same as the character, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, loads of other titles. And I thought if they nail this, this could open the door for other Bitmap Brother games to be mm. to be brought to the forefront. And it was just awful. Yeah, it was at absolutely awful and I, in fact i was so close to, to putting the money down and buying it and i remember i'm just going to read a review on this and i read one review and i thought ah, the person's looking at it is like a modern game you know this that, and the other and then i read article after article after article and they were like everything that's good about gods is not here and at that mm. point i just had this horrible sinking feeling where someone's done a money grab on an ip yeah thrown a bit of money to make it look a bit more polished and for the hd screens and it's just released a turd basically and mm. as i've always said you can take a turd you can't polish it but you can put sprinkles on it and i think yeah. this is a perfect example of where that's happened because visually it looks okay i think the original graphics looked fine if they had just taken that and uprated the sprites i think it would have been fine but they completely butchered it and the problem with that is is that entire genre now, in terms of that that um, IP, is dead because everyone's mm. going to remember. Oh yeah, that IP of that crap game that was released. Um, one game that I actually own that I've not actually played the re- remake or reversion of it is um, Shadow of the Beast. Now, <laughs> Shadow of the Beast has been often commented by me as a beautiful game, as a tech demo but as an actual game, is the biggest pile of crap I've ever played. <laughs> it, it, it's the most random game. The storyline makes no sense. It's just stuff that appears at nowhere. You can't do nothing about it. At some point, he's wearing a jet jetpack for no reason. You've got no <laughs> idea where you're going. It's just horrible. And then someone said to me, oh, you know they've done a remake kind of of it for the PS4, right? And I went, what? Why? So apparently, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think it was a Chinese developer picks up the IP. Okay. And has, made, and has made this, like, apparently, I still haven't played it, I've got it boxed in my living room, um, <laughs> of a semi-decent version of the game. And I thought, hmm, how hypocritical is this if Dean says the game is crap and then plays the PS4 version and then likes it? How controversial. But hmm. this is where I've always said, if you pick up the IP and you stay true to its source you do what's right for the fans and i think the other thing that's important is that you have fan input yes and one example one example of this is um i think it was my previous podcast guest actually rob anderson he actually um was one of the co-creators of the game moonstone that was on yep. the Amiga. Um, one of my favorites and, ever <laughs> fantastic guy completely knowledgeable and is apparently in the process of re- making a reboot remake of that game oh wow the one thing he said is that his uh, there is an online community i forget the, I forgot the name of the website i'll put it in the description of the links at some point if i find it um and yeah that community is completely thriving there are people who have made extra sprites and hd versions of those sprites and have taken the pc version of that edition of the game and completely uprated it so 
by having that input and then having his original art style added to that means that if the community have already been partly involved in that, the end result should be something that everybody's happy with. Yeah. But, but when you take something like Gods, where they go completely on a wild tangent and go, well, this is my vision, this is what I think it is, and then people like me who have absolutely loved Bitmap Brothers games, hmm. and they completely butcher it, it was, it, I mean, honestly, it's, it's a complete shame. And I think the other problem is, is when you start to think about other Amiga games that could have been remade, you know, as I said, Chaos Engine, then you start looking down the the line at things like Speedball 2. Speedball you know, 2, I've, yeah. I've been longing for a HD, <laughs> HD version of that game to be released, you know. And, I was... Um... And, and it scares me that somebody's going to pick that IP up and just completely obliterate it. As long as it's not EA, I don't care. <laughs> as long as it's not EA, because... I, 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 I was I was looking uh, I was looking on an abandonware website to get some games to like because I wanted to basically do some YouTube videos about games I used to love and why they deserve a remake and one of the ones that I always loved was Speedball because it was just so it was so stupid it was brilliant exactly <laughs> you know you, you've you've just decapitated somebody with a with a football, pretty much, <laughs> and you've got someone in the background who's like ice cream, <laughs> bloody ice cream <laughs> seller in the south in, in the stands, and it's like that's brilliant. It is, and, and I think, and that's the thing, right? Is it's those iconic phrases that make a game like that. And again, you know, I know I can't remember who owns the Bitmap Brother rights now. I I think I could be wrong. I think it may be. 2k games or somebody else i can't remember now. Ah. i think it may have changed hands possibly twice um but again the, the problem is is you know there are people who hold on to these ips and, and i understand you know i think um atari have gone around buying up a few old ips and mm. things like that and and i understand it's a business it's good to have these ips on board because you know obviously it's a it's a way of bringing an extra revenue but at the same point i think when it comes to to gaming if you're going to take an ip purely in the basis of just being like i have a thing that is completely immoral if you're yeah. going to take it and and try and do something with it i i think that's a lot better and as you mentioned it's really sad that there are a lot of big companies ea being one that have thousands of ips under their their waist i mean one ea game which isn't an ea game which which is now probably disney i think yeah um, which is an IP I have been longing for a reboot of, um, is the game Full Throttle, which is the point-and-click LucasArts adventure game. There was actually a game that was prepared to come out on the PlayStation 1. They canned it. yeah. And everybody said, I wonder if it's because it was the tech that was holding it back. And everyone was like, well, the PS2's been and gone. The PS3's been and gone. Is it going to come out? And then all of a sudden, Disney obviously snap up LucasArts. Mm. You know, they've just obtained all of these hundreds of IPs that exist. And the only one I think that they've actually done anything with is um, Sam and Max. They did a yeah. VR adventure. Um, there was a VR headset, uh, an Oculus or Meta Quest um, kind of adventure that was like point and click, but, but in VR. And it's just a shame that there are just so many of these IPs sitting waiting to be relaunched and and you know as we've mentioned with streets of rage when you get that perfect blend of nostalgia with modern it just clicks perfectly i mean it's like there are so many there are so many ips where people of my kind of age you know in their 40s from their heyday gaming in the 90s and you could reboot these and if you did it well if you did it with love and if you did it for the fans yeah. You'd have an instant hit on your hands because Agreed. all all the people of my age would be like, "Oh God, yeah, I remember that from from being like a, a young teen on the Amiga or on the SNES or on the original PlayStation or whatever you were playing on." Just being like, mm. "Yes, I'm having some of that," and I think I think you know it's so much uh, so much of a shame that money talks these days yes. because. You know, the majority of the games that I genuinely think would would really capture the imagination and bring people back to 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 their childhood. Uh, 
it's very short sighted because people don't see um people don't see the the possibility for those to actually have that kind of comeback they mm. they'll go with something that they think can make an a- absolutely astronomical amount of money rather than making games from the heart and i think that's why games like streets of rage and it's shredder's revenge the, mm-hmm. the turtles one i think that's why it works so well because we all played those in the arcade or on our home consoles as, as kids and we we long for that oh god why do i have to be an adult I want to be a teenager again. I, w- I want to have this sort of this reckless abandon of just playing games until God knows how, what time in the morning. And you know, it's it, uh, and other things as well. It's like in the last couple of years, games that were absolutely critically panned at the time, like Night Trap, having this <laughs> massive resurgence, almost like an adult meme. Yes, it's true, and it's it's just incredible to see because I I got Night Trap on my Sega CD when I was probably about thirteen, I think. So I shouldn't have had it. I was a bit naughty there, <laughs> um, but again, it was it wasn't a good game. In fact, it was a bad game, mm. but because of the limitations of the technology. When you've got it, when you've got a new, brand spanking new version running on better technology that that has better reactions to your inputs, and you can it's actually playable. You know, it's it's a lot better. It's cheesy as hell, mm. but that's what that's what people love it for. The fact that it was it was so bad. It's like old horror movies. It's like. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's like the Evil Dead or something. <laughs> yeah, Evil Dead. Evil Dead. It's like I absolutely love those films because they are so bad. Mm. And it's just brilliant. The one bit that always makes me laugh, I think it's the Evil Dead 2 when Ash steps on the um the trap door and crushes one of the zo- or the zombie's head and you see the eye fly across <laughs> but it's actually on a tiny little yeah. stick and you can see the stick and I was like yeah. that just adds that little bit of charm that you need you need to yeah. such a low budget film, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's just a shame. But again, that's another series that really took a, a real downturn, and the sign sort of, kind of brought itself back up. Um, there was a terrible Evil Dead game for the Dreamcast and PlayStation. I mm. think there might have been two actually, if I remember correctly. Um, and then there was another one released, which was just just god awful and then there was another one that was released not so long ago which i believe was an online multiplayer game yeah it was a it was a bit like dead by daylight it was um yeah, kind of like 4v1 mm. um 4v1 like hunting kind of um oh, i can't think what do they call it now but um yeah it was this uh, actually pretty good you know, mm. it it was as I say, it, it there are lots of clones of very similar games like exactly. Dead by Daylight, Friday the Thirteenth, the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre that's just come yes. out. But Friday the Thirteenth, uh, Evil Dead, um, it just had so much. I just had so much imagination to it, and it was like cause it was from all the films, and awesome. had like different different characters from all the films and everything i know that most of them did but it was just uh like the different it, it, it the fact that it didn't take itself seriously at all course, was yeah. the is the best part of it because you don't want you don't watch a horror film these days to be like genuinely scared you watch them <laughs> because you want to have a bit of you want to have a bit of fun if there's a couple of jump scares in there yeah brilliant fantastic but you want something that's just gonna entertain you and sometimes even a bad film can be extremely entertaining i i i 100 percent in agreement i mean i've definitely watched my fair share of um poor films or low budget films but there's <laughs> there's a there's a charm about it you know and, and again i think when you think about um even old games you know i mean i was talking to people before about the original spectrum and things like that and 
I, I'm not the hugest fan of the Spectrum. I do respect it as a platform. I do respect what it can do. But I think the one thing that I've always had a respect for is people always trying to make the best out of something that wasn't meant to do anything. Hmm. It was just meant to be a, a basic computer. And, you know, there are, for instance, um, versions of the Robocop game on the Spectrum, which when you initially look at it, you think, God almighty, this looks like absolute hell. But you actually play it and go, do you know what? This is actually not bad, you know? And again, yeah. it's kind of got that that charm to it. And I don't know if it's just because of the IP, but it's also because the the platform you're playing it on shouldn't really be doing this. But someone's yeah. gone to the end of making it. So it's almost got that that little bit of low-budget charm to it, a bit like The Evil Dead, you know? Mm. No, and I think... Um certainly with uh, cause there are a fair few games that are coming out at the moment that um uh I was watching uh watching a, a channel on youtube the other night and they were saying about games that released on dead consoles and one of the one of the games that's been mentioned around the groups on facebook um one that's just released for the nintendo entertainment system like literally mm. in the last in the last month Sure. And it's just like, it, just like it, the, the reviews it's getting are absolutely incredible. And seeing what they can get out of a thirty-five-year-old console is, you know, because obviously they have the technology to to be able to optimize everything. They know what they can and what they can't do. And even one um, one game that puts. A, um, a Wi-Fi chip inside the cartridge, so you wow. can play you can play this NES game online. Whoa! Yeah, I it's mind-boggling, and I, I can't remember what game it was, but I, I, I saw no. it I saw it advertised the other day because wow. they were saying about the incredible advances that you know imagination, modern imagination that people use mm. on retro things to to get stuff out of them that you'd never you'd never imagined would be possible and with the technology you shouldn't be able to do i mean that is insane i mean the most modern version that i kind of had had here or have here is um there was a thing called dream pie that was made for dreamcast and um the dreamcast by standard came with a, a modem adapter you mm. could buy a broadband adapter but if you're gonna have a look how much those are on ebay it's a little bit scary <laughs> yeah um because obviously broadband wasn't a huge thing at those times. So so what you essentially do is you use the Raspberry Pi as like a, a middleman between your broadband and the, the modem adapter. And through that, there's a completely online thriving community of people who are still playing the Dreamcast online. And I did yeah. a stream on Twitch, and I might do one again soon where I was playing uh, Quake 3 Arena online with <laughs> these guys. And they were like, do you have Discord? And I'm like, well, I'm in the middle of a stream at the minute. They're like, cool, let's get in a chat. And then all of a sudden there was like this chat in in twitch and you know i'm playing the dreamcast online whilst i'm streaming online and my brain is exploding into a thousand pieces <laughs> going none of this should be possible but it is happening and again as you've mentioned that there are so many wonderful pieces like that the most recent iteration of that i'm aware of is the original xbox um somebody has made it so that you can reflash the firmware in an xbox if it's modified um, or soft modded, I believe, and the original Xbox software can be redone. And again, similar to the um, Dream Pie, there's now an online Xbox Live service where you register like you would with a normal Xbox all those years ago, and you can play a certain amount of games. And they're adding games to this list hmm. kind of on a monthly basis. So again, it just shows that. You know, even though we've got, you know, I'm sitting here next to a, a 3080 NVIDIA GeForce RTX graphics card that can do ray tracing and stuff like that, people are still turning back to these 15, 20, 25, 35 year old consoles mm. and, and injecting modern day tech into it. And it's just, it's, it's mind blowing to see these things happen. Problem is with a lot of modern day stuff is it feels quite sterile hmm. there's there, there are games obviously games get released that are absolutely fantastic brilliant and everything but certainly around the indie scene is where you see a lot of the 
a lot of the most amazing games come out because mm. they're almost not because it's a labor of love it's not something that you know you've you've been told you've got to do within six months and you're you're crunching hard and it releases with releases with loads of bugs and everything it's something that maybe half a dozen people do in a small office or in their bedrooms you know you'll have one guy doing the music one guy one guy doing the the coding and somebody else doing the graphics and the story and stuff and they'll all like throw their ideas in and you know after a year or two they'll come out with this really cute little game that will just capture everyone's imagination and just be like that's incredible that that is a labor of love that that's not something that was done for money that is something that was done for the absolute pure enjoyment of doing it perfect case in point one man toby fox undertale mm Yes. When you look at that game, that's that that is the ultimate. Uh, that is the uh, the epitome of a passion project. Absolutely. And it caught everyone's imagination so so massively. And the fact that it was a retro style game, but in terms of what it actually did. Um, no spoilers for anyone who hasn't played it, but there's some really creepy stuff in there, some real fourth wall breaking stuff. Mm. And you're like, this is so well programmed. You know, the fact that you don't see this kind of stuff hardly ever, even in AAA games. And yeah, there's this one guy with his computer who's just done the whole lot and he's turned it into this really creepy thing that really messes with your head as well it's like wow that's you know that's special that's a that's a once in a generation mm. kind of special i agree i mean one one other gentleman who comes to mind i keep plugging my own podcast which sounds like <laughs> i'm trying to get more views and I, I promise i'm not doing this on purpose but um a couple of episodes ago i had a, a gentleman on called fran and he made the game unmetal um mm which the only way I can describe it is like a very tongue-in-cheek version of the MSX version of Metal Gear. Yeah, It is full to the brim of comedy, but the gameplay is excellent. The scripting is excellent. And one of the things that fascinated me the most was, as you've mentioned, a very, very small amount of people. I think it was just him and I think a couple of voiceover artists, and that was it. And what was fascinating was that he's built this, I guess, ecosystem of, of a community through some of the other games that he's made as well, where people have said, do you want us to help with the translations of this game into mm. a different language? Do you want us to do the voiceovers for this? And again, that whole sense of community coming together to just expose this game to other people, it's just, it, it's its the perfect example. And you would never see a AAA title do that. Very, no. very, very rare. You would ever see a community, probably modern day times, where people have taken like a Japanese game and reconverted it for, for Western markets. But uh, in fact, I can't even think, besides old retro games, of a modern game that has been taken and completely rejuvenated by a community. Mm. There is a single one that comes to mind. I mean, you do get some. Um, it's like the Sonic Frontiers, mm. the new mm. one that's come out, released in uh, certainly on PC. I think uh, they did it for, but it released in a not a great state. I mean, a lot of stuff yeah. doesn't release great on PC. But then the modding community, they're like, right, yeah. okay, bang. Within two weeks. They've released all these patches from the modding community mm. that the developers haven't even managed. And that is that is the power of, of the community, of the gaming community, the, the, the fan community, the enthusiast community that mm. exists. And I the, the only thing I wish I I have a big problem with Bethesda. I I love their games. Wait in line. <laughs> I I love their games. I think Fallout specifically is like one of my favorite one of my favorite IPs. Mm. 
But they, oh, they, they, they mess so much up. But to their credit, you know, they do. Uh, they're kind of. Hmm, I want to say very enthusiastic about modding, but mm. that's probably because they monetize it. Yeah. But I think if every if every developer was as accepting, I mean, if you look at you know Skyrim mods, yeah, completely nice. transformative, um, Skyrim, Fallout, you know, whatever Bethesda game you want to criticize, there is a modding community that has come along and said, let's either make it better or let's make it really damn funny. Yeah. And and do you know what? The Skyrim example is probably one of the examples that, that probably is the modern one that I was searching for, actually, where I I genuinely believe because of the amount of mods that have been made for that game, it has kept it going for mm. year after year after year. I remember I mean I, I played Skyrim to death on what would it have been the Xbox 360, and then I think yeah. I got it on PC. And I remember <coughs> a friend of the channel, um, a guy called VR Bug, um, used to do some VR streams. Uh, lovely chap, absolutely lovely chap. And I watched him once play Skyrim in VR. And I was looking and I was going, this looks like a completely different game. And his words to me were, go on Steam now, buy it, try it, get all of the update patches, the high quality resolution stuff. And tell me it's not one of the prettiest games you've ever played. Mm. Me being Captain Cynical, yeah, lying. <laughs> I get all the mods, I install them, patch this, do that, get the headset on, click play, and the first words out of my mouth were, oh, <laughs> I was very wrong. The, the, even the things like the sounds that people have improved yeah. for directional sound was just... It was exceptional, you know, when you're sat on the car and you're going along and you can hear the creak of every wheel that's going over the oh the, yes. the kind of you know, the, the unlevel ground, and then you're hearing people talk over here as you're walking past. And when you're playing that with a headset on, you're obviously getting a certain amount of immersion. Doing that in VR was a completely different kettle <laughs> of fish. Completely different kettle of fish. It was absolutely outstanding. And in fact, dare I say, besides some of the mods that I've seen for um, for Cyberpunk, probably the most breathtaking game I've I've ever seen in VR, mm. without question. It's just yeah. stunning, absolutely stunning. But to say it's all powered by, it's powered by love. Mm. It's you know you release a game from a from a big developer, buggy, imperfect. It's got charm to it because, you know, a lot of these games do have a lot of charm to them. That's why people fall in love with them and they feel sure. the need to to mod them. Because, mm. you know, you don't mod a game that you hate unless you're just going to completely lampoon it. Um, exactly. But, you know, it's it's something it's something that's got to I mean, as much as I love Nintendo, <laughs> you're never going to get Nintendo saying, "Oh yeah, of course, mod our games. That's that's fine." Um, you know, Nintendo that's, obviously have some of my favorite of franchises. The but, seal um, of approvals there for a reason. <laughs> you know? But as I say, it's it's a shame because, like I say, Nintendo is something that is you know you don't get an awful lot of Nintendo games that that release and they're not they're not good. Um, you know, the most recent Pokemon ones, I know have come into a lot of criticism because of like frame rate and uh, overall performance, um, which, you know, even on the Switch, you know, being as not next gen as it is, shouldn't have those problems. Um, you know, you've, you've just got to put that down to, you know, the devs wanting to rush a game out without fully optimizing it. Um but you could guarantee that within three or four weeks, if they'd had modders able to get online, that that would have been fixed. Mm. They would have they would have found like the memory leaks and everything, and and just been like patch it, optimize it, do it. Do, do you know what you you raise something that I think is quite interesting? Where 
I, I remember some of the later Pokemons, well, the most re- recent Pokemons come out. And you kind of, I, I mean, I've watched a few streams on it. Um, you know, I, I'm not the biggest Pokemon head. You know, I, I have hmm. a, I, I've dabbled is probably the, the best way <laughs> I would describe it. I, I'm a dabbler when it comes to, to Pokemon. But, you know, when, when I'm still seeing people playing Pokemon on this, yeah. which is an original Game Boy, and when I'm seeing people playing modded versions of the Game Boy Advance version, so much so that it's more popular than the latest releases. Mm. You've got a serious problem because yeah. you're trying to make it next gen. You're trying to make it pretty. You're trying to make it run at 30, 60 frames, whatever it is you're trying to achieve. But that's what people want. They want the Pokemon experience. I don't think trying to elaborate and make it something bigger than what it actually should be mm. is the right way to go. And again, Pokemon fans may tear me apart for that. But again, through what I have seen, if people are still longing for that Pokemon experience and are playing, you know, original versions on a Game Boy or um, modified versions that give you different challenges in a Game Boy Advance version, surely at some point you go, well, we've tried this new thing that fell on its ass, and we clearly don't know what we're doing. Go back, go back to what you know and what yeah. people love. Right? Yeah, I mean, you can you can see a little bit of it, bit of it in the DNA of like Tears of the Kingdom. Hmm. Um, haven't played it myself. But I've watched a fair bit of it, and obviously you've got the uh, the element where you combine things and you like you mod your weapons and stuff, and you use your creativity and. Uh, even the devs have come out and said that in like the first couple of weeks of the game being released, people are solving the puzzles in ways that they didn't even think were possible and they programmed it. Mm. And okay. it's just, it, it's amazing to see, that, you know, obviously these people, the devs, they are like the beating heart of the game. They, they make it what it, they make it work or they make it not work. Mm. But when you get it in the hands of the fans, it's that, it's that creativity and like the outside the box thinking um, mm. that you can only do when you're not so close to a project that you kind of get blinkered. But I mean, Tears of the Kingdom looks, looks to be an absolutely fantastic game with very much uh, angled in the, in the direction of be creative. You know, it's mm. a Zelda game, but be creative, try different things. And I think that's a really good step forward. But again, the fans have just completely taken it two or three steps further on than that. And it's like, ah, okay. And I think that's that's good because we need that kind of there's too much there's too much kind of like linear. And linear is sometimes good. You know, it, it mm. it's good to know exactly what you're getting. But sometimes just throwing a, you know, little pinch of this here and there just to make things a little bit more uh, unpredictable yeah and i think think that's the other thing is it the one thing i was gonna say is it gives the the user or the player in this instance i'm talking like about work it gives the (laughs) it gives the it gives the player um more creativity and flexibility in knowing that they can solve things in a different way Hmm. In a completely different way that someone else who plays that game may may hmm. have do it may do it in that way. I mean, I <laughs> slight spoilers, but um, to go from one platform that was in the sky to another one, um, you kind of get these like floating board things that you kind of hmm. launch off this platform. And I did it once, and I was kind of like, well, I'm just moving around, and it's just you know slowly dipping down and dipping down. You kind of get these little, um, I guess, propeller type things that you can attach to it. And I sat there and I went, hang on a minute. If I put two either side and one at the back, I wonder if this will work. And it bloody did. Yeah. I turned two of them on. It shot off and it was going and going. Obviously, it was slowly dipping down. And I went, well, if I stand at the back and kick the one at the back, is it going to work? And it did. And it took off. And I went, I've just made a plane. Yeah. And I rejoiced. And then I stood in the wrong bit and fell off. But anyway, <laughs> we'll look past. We'll look past. <laughs> but again, but you know, the, the way you're meant to do that, you're meant to move around that platform to kind of keep it gliding and stuff. Mm. And I just went, 
screw that, I'm making a plane. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it how I want. <laughs> but it's it's that kind of imagination that came from toys like Lego. Of course. You know, give you the bricks, make whatever you want. You know, just give you a big box of bricks and you can make whatever you want. Most of the time it would be a house or a car, but yeah. another or time it would be like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, 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 there was no there was no limits on what you could do. And I think that they've certainly they've certainly shown that if you give people the tools, they're going to find ways to be creative, entertaining, uh, X-rated um, <laughs> yeah. with some yeah, of the so builds you've seen. Those. Yeah, I've seen a few of those that looked a bit um, rather risque, but we won't yeah. go into that. <laughs> but, but it's... it's I like the fact that you compared it to Lego. And the reason why I think that's important is that, you know, as you said, it, it builds that level of creativity. And the reason why I think that's interesting is if you compare it to something like um, uh, Minecraft, hmm. I remember somebody making <laughs> a replica life-size version of this to scale, massive, that actually worked in Minecraft. Hmm. And I was going... How? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Yeah. But then I thought it's brilliant, and even things like the little dial at the side, they managed to actually get that working. So as you scrolled it down, it turned down the brightness, and there was a volume. I'm going, but why? And then you think, yes, indeed. But at least they've done it. This is a cool thing to do. So yeah, and you get like you get versions of Doom that run on a toaster or something, <laughs> and it's like, how? <laughs> how is it even possible? I think the craziest one of those I've seen is Doom running on a pregnancy test. I was like, <laughs> who, who's, who in their right mind sat there and went, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to nip down to Lloyd's Pharmacy, other pharmacies are available, and go, I'm going to go and get <laughs> a pregnancy test. What? Oh, oh, uh, are you are you expecting? No, I'm off to go and make Doom, love. I'll be back in 10 minutes. Mm. Like, what are you doing? But it's that it's that kind of thinking that needs to be uh needs to be like you need to harvest it enrich it and mm. and put that kind of creativity into gaming you know it's it's okay having people modding stuff and doing fan stuff but i honestly think that a lot of the best people a lot of the absolutely most creative people in the world are not necessarily the ones who are making the games. It, it's the ones who are like, yeah, that was an okay game, but what if? What if I yeah. do this? And imagine what you could imagine what you could come out could come up with and uh, and release if you just had a couple of those people every now and then just coming in and having a little having a little sprinkle here and there. One game that comes to mind is um, No Man's Sky. Mm. And, you know, from when that was released, which was... Oh, dreadful. A real, a real awful release, to what it has become now. I mean, it's just... It, it's insane. And again, a lot of that has been driven by this... This desire to make better. And most mm. people would have said, well, do you know what? We've had a semi positive response out of this you know i think we've managed to save this ip let's go and move on something else but there's just such a a desire to keep it going as a business you'd sit there and go well why this is what people want we'll just keep going as long as people want it i mean mm. Elite i mean dangerous is another perfect example yeah of that. they're just it's just constantly going all the time i mean you you've got to give hello games a bit of credit um, you know, they it, it released in such a god awful state. You know, the just some some of the stories of, you know, how the development was affected. Like they lost the entire they lost the entire thing when their offices flooded and all their computers were destroyed. And it's like, how do you even come back from that? You, you've got to have such a passion to to be able to turn it around and say, well, you know, yeah, we've got to start pretty much everything all over again, but we're mm. going to do it. So many people have just given up. And no, right. it didn't It didn't release in the kind of state that they wanted it to. They they were, they were admitted it themselves. And, you know, the, the, the whole point is that you can make an absolutely 
dreadful mistake. It's like with anything in life, you can absolutely spanner it like you <laughs> would not believe, make so many mistakes, up so, upset so many people. But if you say to yourself, do you know what? I'm going to keep on, I'm going to keep on working with this. I will have, I, I will redeem myself. I'll show people that they were right to be excited in the first place. Hmm. And that even though it didn't turn out how it was meant to, I'm going to keep on with it until it does. Because now No Man's Sky is, you know, it's a game that, I mean, I haven't played it for a while, but I absolutely loved it. It was, you know, it was everything they kind of said it was going to be and a little bit more. Sure. And, you know, it's it, it's like there are... I mean, personally, a, another game that's that's done this, I've never been able to, in spite of being a huge Final Fantasy fan, never really got into 11, uh, into 14. I played 11 for about four years, but for, when 14 released, it was it was it was bad. Um, I played it for about a month when when a, a Realm Reborn came back, and it was so much better. But something something about it just didn't click with me i don't know why i, I don't know why that i don't know if maybe it's because i'd played 11 for like four years because i'd mm. spent so long playing world of warcraft <laughs> that going to a new mmo just felt it felt really out of place and i dare say I, i'd probably be able to go along and and pick it up now and eat my own words and absolutely <laughs> really enjoy it um but mmos are a huge commitment really really huge commitment and certainly um yeah probably not the kind of thing i want to be getting into <laughs> that kind of depth so little enough free time as it is so <laughs> you, you you mentioned something there about um no man's sky and and i feel i feel like it was almost the perfect description of yourself to a certain degree um you know, I mean, if we touch on your your music career slightly, mm. um, you know, I I myself remember you uh, winning and uh, and being very successful with your music releases and stuff. And um, you know, I mean, I'm talking to you here now. You know, I've never had any um, what would I say prior judgments of yourself, but obviously, <laughs> you know, similar to. The, the release of No Man's Sky, there was so much negative hate because of what the, the media had drummed up similar to mm. your life. And, and you know, kind of this whole whirlwind of news gets caught in. And as we all know, controversy sells, whether it's the music industry, the games industry, or, or any other industry. And um, I think the one thing that, that I will always remember is um, your talent when it comes to your singing ability. You know, I don't think anybody could ever doubt that um in fact before we came on the air i actually had a quick look at youtube at one of your uh, oh dear music <laughs> and, and 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 funny enough i just wanted to gauge where people's minds were at and sh the shocking thing for me was is that i was initially gonna see what i thought was a lot of hate and strangely there was comments that were three four a year ago and it was incredibly positive to see people say, you know, let's cut the BS. The man's clearly talented. You know, it's one of my favourite versions of this song and things like that. I've got a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of friends with a lot of YouTube accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Paid off a lot of people. But again, you know, to use the comparison of, I guess, your your career, which I hope you eventually get back into to making music in some form. Maybe it's game music. Who knows? Maybe that's the yeah, thing I'd love to, that. To, to bring you back in. And, you know, again, when it comes to a passion project, you were obviously passionate about music, you know, and, and unfortunately your, I guess your, your path wasn't, I would say the most um, appreciative. And I don't think you had the right, um, again, correct me if I'm wrong here. I don't think you had the right, people guiding you on that journey um and that's probably why you lost a little bit of your way and i think everybody's guilty of that mm. if, you, if you if you surround yourself with the wrong type of people who are yes yes people or they are 
using you for their wealth or you know they're trying to get something out of you whether that's a skill set or something like that the impact that can have on you long term can be incredibly damaging but i think at a core if you stay true to yourself your skill set and what you do similar to you know the, the guys at no man's sky the truth can't be taken away from what what you have made and you know that i think that's why um you know for, for anyone who's who's listening or watching this you know I, i've spoken to to richard for for a, a while now and you know i've not had any issues with him you know we've spoken about a few things of your past and um you know i think people's judgment back then i think would be completely different if it happened now that was one thing that i would i i've been thinking about this all week and i feel like now in society we're probably a little bit more accepting of the underdog and really want to find out the truth and i think through social media and people actually looking into stories a bit more rather than just seeing the headline that says xyz has done xyz and they go mm. right that's a piece of news and i accept that as as gospel but I think now, because we challenge things a little bit more, it's very hard to get that over with people. Obviously, there are Daily Mail and Daily Star readers. We can't do much about that. But, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you know, it, I, I think we're a little bit more inquisitive now. And the same thing goes with the games industry. You know, there are so many scandals that happen and, and people get accused of, you know, running off with code and stuff like that. But then the stories slowly start to come out and the truth of very starts to come out. And I think the one thing that, I want to, um, I guess, remind you of yourself and the listeners of this podcast is that, you know, Richard is an incredibly talented person. He's a very lovely person. He's got a clear love, passion for gaming. And, you know, if there is anybody that I would love to see a resurgence for, even if it is in a uh, a music form when it comes to gaming, it, it should definitely be yourself. So um, anyway, that's, that's my TED talk over about <laughs> Richard Waller. But, uh, you know, again, I, I think you had a very... Well, I mean, I can't say you didn't. You did have a very hard time. Um, we all in the UK witnessed that. And I think it was um, incredibly narrow-minded of many people who jumped on the person that was being kicked down and thought that that's the right thing to do. But I, I think the media have changed their ways. I think a lot of um, the media has had to change because of things such as mental health now being such a an epidemic in this country mm. uh, me myself suffering from from mental health issues myself um i have a lot more respect for the words i use the way i deliver them and, and the things that i think about before i say them because i think there's a lot of chances where you have that extra few seconds to think about something and once it leaves your mouth it's very hard to take that back um but coming on to music what is your favorite gaming piece of music oh there's lots there's <laughs> lots and lots i, I mean, was expecting to say that <laughs> i mean just to just to go back a, a little bit um i think whatever whatever kind of era you're in with with, with uh, terms of whether it be press or social media and everything there's always going to be there's always going to be an agitator. Of course. There's always going to be something trying to upset upset the flow. Um, one of the things I find, um, and I will come back to obviously to a question, one of the things I find <laughs> the most depressing is the fact that, you know, obviously people are a lot more aware about mental health issues these days. Mm, sure. um, but, it's almost acts like for a certain subsection of people, it almost gives them the fuel. There's more, there's more extremism between the two, the two polar opposites than there used to be. There's, there's so much more, uh, you know, it's not just trolling these days. It's like, actually, it seems so much nastier than somebody just having a, mm. having a, having a bit of a trolley joke at somebody. Um, sure. that's the, that's one of the things that really worries me. Um, it's going to, it's going to new extremes. Um, I don't get me wrong. I've been guilty of some stuff 
in my past. I've there have been times when I've been a very angry person looking to lash out. Hmm. Um, but you know, there's there's one thing I, I've always the one thing I've always like kept to myself um, and within myself as who I am is the fact that you know people regardless of who they are where they come from regardless of, regardless of gender um sexuality race religion anything you know we're all we're all made of the same stuff and it really pains me to see i mean i i don't have any kids but if i if i do which my fiance hoping i fiance is hoping but I will obviously um one thing I I look at and I think to myself it's almost like you've got to be on a crusade to stop the negativity from yeah from festering and spilling out because it's just like everywhere you look there's another there's another like bonfire of hatred springing up and whether I, you know, whether I've just had my rose tinted glasses on for the last 40 years mm. and it's just really coming out now or whether we have become a lot more, whether certain sections of people have become a lot more empowered to share their extreme views, it's, it, it's worrying. Mm. And, you know, it's, I feel that it's <clears throat> only going to get worse. Certainly in, in the climate we are today with, you know, so many we obviously we've had the pandemic we've got the cost of living crisis people put under pressure uh mental health decline um not enough access to the um to the kind of things that people need to uh, to straighten their heads out and yeah. you know it's so easy so easy for somebody to get something inside their head and become almost indoctrinated to a yeah to a way of to a way of thinking and you know all you've got to do is look at like the political stuff we've had over the last five years or if you look to america with all the all the polarizing one side or the other and it's it's genuinely scary genuinely scary to think that we could you know we're we're in peacetime at the moment, but we've got a war at our very core in mm. in who we are and you know how we act how we act to other people and it's it's so easy to to get to get drawn in on that and I think that's just it's absolutely heartbreaking mm. because you know well, at times yeah, at times yeah. like now when you know we things are things aren't great. You know, we shouldn't be putting each other down. We should be looking to, you know, pull together and, you know, fix the mess that we've been left in. You know, because if the people at the top aren't going to aren't going to help us, you know, it, it's us. It's up to us at the bottom to to say, right, OK, well, let's club together. Let's mend this. Let's put our differences aside and, you know, actually be decent human beings. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And I think an example I would use is <clears throat> not to dwell on war, but if you think of, you know, this country when World War Two was happening, mm. you know, places were getting obliterated and people didn't turn their backs. They they were taking people in and helping each other and sharing rations and things like that. And mm. you know, I'm I'm not saying that we're <laughs> we're we're in that type of scenario, but it, it almost needs that kind of um sense of community you know? yeah and and i think part of the problem is and, and it's very interesting that you mentioned the the u.s i've always said that the u.s is a very welcoming and warm place and and you know similar to the things that you've mentioned they have a very i, I guess open atmosphere when it comes to, to people of all different ethnic origins and well i mean the, the, the entire country was built on immigrants near enough yeah exactly um, <laughs> historically but um you know, when it comes to voting times, I've always said, you know, it, it must be awful to think that you only have two choices. You know, you're mm. either team A or team B. And the problem is, is that 
And unfortunately, you're starting to see a little bit of that here, where if you're Team A, then Team B has to hate you. And it's like, well, yeah. if I align with this, then that's my choice. But at the end of the day, we still want what's best for everybody, right? Yeah, it's not like absolutely. I'm, I'm picking Team B because I want to see you fail. Well, I think that is the problem that exists. And this exists all over the world it's not just within the western world um i think it's it's a it's a major issue and and when you come into people having a higher power in dictating things to, to spin it into a a gaming side there are particular people that i can think of in my head that are even in the retro scene or, or other different areas of gaming who who gatekeep a lot of mm. gaming um a perfect example is I saw someone a long time ago tweeting about, um, I think it was a, a woman who was tweeting about retro gaming and stuff like that. And the amount of hate she was getting because she was just a woman who happened to be enjoying retro games. I'm like, yeah. What, why is why why is that a problem? You know, gaming is not an exclusive thing to men. It's not like, well, men invented it, so it's our thing. We can look mm. after it. It's like it, it's open to anybody. There isn't like a you must tick this box in order to do this and that. I mean, it's it's absolutely barbaric. And one thing I saw recently that actually made me really sad was um, it was actually during my Twitch stream, and um, obviously, if you don't. Have, have, if you don't subscribe to my channel, you get adverts, um, <laughs> unfortunately. But one of the adverts was, um, uh, I think Sky were doing some sort of campaign, and they invited like a group of male gamers to sit in this room. And as they were playing this game, they were feeding like insults that women would normally get during yes. online gameplay. And I, I was like, it's 2023. Are we seriously still going through this? And it... it it was it was almost like I had this internal co internal confusion where I was like, I'm really happy that they're doing this, but at the same time I was like, Christ, like we're, we're still having to go through this. And yeah, you know, I've interviewed um, a variety of different people. In fact, one interview that I'm hopefully is going to be uploaded very soon is a, a woman who runs a, a Counter Strike um, CS:GO team. Um, hmm. She's Ukrainian herself, and you know, her story and what she's been through and obviously the negativity about her being a woman in the games industry leading a group of men in professional gaming. I mean, you couldn't get much more <laughs> a, a, a gatekeeper's worst nightmare you know, yeah. you're watching this, <laughs> this woman power through and lead this gaming sector. And and again, I, I just, I can't believe in 2023 we're still having to deal with this type of stuff. And I've always said, I think a lot of this comes down to education um, with all things, whether it's race, religion, creed, culture, food, whatever it may be, even music to a certain extent. Mm. Uh, you know, I explained to someone the other day that you know, drum and bass came from a, a break beat that was done by a, a um, jazz player, and they were like, huh, what? And I was like, yeah, um, get over it, do your research. So, um, <laughs> you know, so... Um, you know, it's one of those things where I've always said it comes down to education. And I think that until we are going to be open and honest with having what I would deem awkward conversations about real life issues, things like gatekeeping in gaming, things like, you know, the, the social anxiety that people in power can impose on people, such as what happened to yourself. Until we start having those very, very serious conversations, I, I can't see things like that changing. And you know, I remember working in a game station many moons ago and, you know, you would see a, a, a girl come in or, or a young woman and she would pick up, I don't know, a copy of FIFA or whatever. And you would kind of go, what? what was she playing that for? And then, you know, fast forward to 2023, the England football team were a lot better than the men's. So, yeah. <laughs> right. So, again, you know, it's it's that whole thing of, you know, when I was back at school, if you saw a girl kicking a ball, you turn your nose up because you didn't know any better. And now they're they're you know, they're some of the top elite athletes in this country. So, yeah, absolutely. It, it just, and, and again, a lot of that comes down to research, because I'm pretty sure that a lot of what I would say hardcore elitist footballers or football supporters would probably have turned their nose up at a Manchester City player or a Manchester United player or a Reading ladies football player going, oh, what are they kicking the ball for? But then suddenly when they see the 
the reward that's coming back, seeing them play at this elite level, mm. seeing them at an international level, performing at a, at a level that's better than the men. You cannot deny that the the, the level that they're playing at is is at the same level as the men, and um, yeah, it may not be as physical, but that the training and everything else that is involved. I, I tell you what, you may say it's not as physical, but I tell you, what, some of the some of the times they get into scrapes with each other. Oh, oh yeah. blimey! I mean, yeah, I they, they, put the, they put the they put the men to shame, and when they when yeah. they go in for hard tackles, it is really hard tackles, and they get straight up. That's, exactly. oh, that's, that, that's exactly. the thing. That's there's the no thing. there's no play acting in women's football. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. I've seen um, I've seen worse tackles in sensible soccer where the men have run, <laughs> and, and that's in pixel form, you know. And and you see um, you, you see some of these women, as you said. I mean, I saw a double leg tackle the other day, and I mm. winced, and I was like. Yeah. The other girl just stood up, like, go on, then have another go. And if it was the guy, he <laughs> would have rolled his way down the tunnel and, you know, onto the uh, medical table. But, um, yeah, th- but there has to be some, some some education around it all. Is, is, you is have to wonder, is it, is, it, is it just a money thing? Because if you look at it, most male footballers... It's not just the wages; it's the sponsorships, it's the it's uh, the uh, the popularity and everything, mm. and it's it's not just about wanting to win the game. It's like doing anything to do that, and obviously, a lot of these uh, you do see still see some really bad tackles in in men's football, um, but it's always the the constant thought of if I don't dive. Do I get yeah. injured? Sure. Am yeah. I going to be out of the game for three months with yeah. cruciate ligament or broken ankle or or whatever? So you can you can kind of see the psychology behind it because because it's so aimed at money and a play a, a world class player who misses six months with yeah. broken bones, ligament damage, whatever like that. Yeah, I can understand. That's an absolute nightmare. Because sure. it's that constant mentality of I have to be the best. You know, when I retire in 10, 15 years' time, I have to be the best player that's ever existed. You know, I'd, I, I have to be at the top of every leaderboard, the top goal scorer, top assists, most games played, most minutes played. And, you know, it, it's, it's, all, it's kind of like, almost like min maxing mm. on a, like a, a, a sporting level. And, I, I think it's it's a vic, it, it's so much a victim of itself um, because there is so much money involved. Okay. You're expect you're expected to. It's like when you go and see a, a, a new movie. If it's not the best movie ever, everyone's like, "Oh well, that wasn't a patch on the old one. They've really lost their way." <laughs> it's true. And it's you know, true. it can still be a serviceable movie, but if it isn't the best one in the series. It's like, oh, what was the point in that? Why did they bother making that one? Mm. And it's that, it's that expectation. So you can see why a lot of this takes place. Um, but you know, as, as you say, it's uh, it, you, you certainly get a lot more uh, grassroots and uh, mm. so a lot more physical in the women's game. I, and I it's fun. Back, yeah, it, it is. I think one of the things that I said before was about the, the company you keep. And I, I was quite shocked when I read this the other day. Former Manchester United defender Wes Brown was mm. bankrupt recently. Yeah. And when you think about that guy's career, playing at one of the biggest clubs in the world, winning the Champions League, Premier League trophies, FA Cups, you know, and again, he must have had such horrific people around him to mm. lose all of that money is is astonishing, you know. Yeah. And, and again, it, it comes down to those few decisions that you can make in your career and in your life that just completely obliterate all of the hard work that you've done. Um, and and it's a shame, you know. I was genuinely shocked, and and it seems to be again a, a big problem that you know the. The lifespan of a, a footballer is is incredibly short, but again, at the same time, if you're not thinking post the game, this is where these issues arise. And he's not the only one. I think um, David James was another one who went bankrupt. Yeah. And, you know, he was. You know, I wouldn't say he was the best goalkeeper in the world, but you know, at the time oh, he, he was, was entertaining. 
exactly. He, he, he did us. He did us a good turn. He did us a good turn. <laughs> And um, um, you know, I, I think he's he's. I mean, he's, he's such a lovely guy. I think I, I met him once before, and he's such an amazing guy. But to think of these elite players that you used to see week in week out, and just to think that all of the, I want to say, millions that they probably earned have just disappeared. It's, it's and then you got players, incredible. and you got players <clears throat> like Dion Dublin, who yeah. put all his money <laughs> into property. And now he's now he's a property guru, and he's presenting on the BBC, and it's like I, that, Holmes under the hammer. Yeah, I mean, it's that's, ridiculous. <laughs> that's the way you do it. That's the way you do it. Mm. I mean, because they. I mean, more so now than ever. Say in the last twenty, thirty years, they actually, they actually give like footballers like financial advisors it's it's whole it's whole part of the package they say right course, okay yeah. this is a good thing to invest in stay clear of this don't buy this and, and most footballers you see will put virtually every penny they own into property because it's going to it's going to be a, a constant source like a a constant pension when they retire and it's just going to be that you know i i i would have loved to have had the kind of money to to invest that kind of level in like property now that would be worth like 10 times what it was <laughs> at, than at the time because that would have set me up for life you know all things aside though you know you you kind of make the best of a situation you handed at the time um but as as i say it's um you you do see you do see a lot of really heartbreaking, like old, old, like people who've played for England, mm -hmm. like um, I forget, uh, was one of the World Cup winners who had to sell his medals. Yeah, that was awful. When to to pay his to pay his heating bills, and I'm like, how how could you? You know, obviously money in football wasn't as much in those days, but you know, how could you let such a such a hero? get to that kind of that kind of level it's it, it it just kind of like goes for the you know the disposable nature of celebrity you know right. these days we're all looking for the next the next big thing and the next flash in the pan and we mm. kind of forget about the people you know who've who've made like the massive you know massive changes massive careers and everything and you think to yourself oh yeah well yeah they don't matter they're they're in the past and everything <laughs> gotta gotta have as much as we can as the next big thing and it's like certainly not so much with music uh, as such because you know you're talking about the big artist you know they're you know, they are set for life but certainly with a lot of the old like sports stars like frank bruno as well mm. you know he he He'd been through just like some absolutely horrid times. A guy who suffered so much with his mm. with his mental health, and you know, fair play to him. He's you know he's done the bravest thing you can possibly do. You know, he's documented it, and he's been mm. like, right, okay, this is this is the pro this is the problem we have in society these days. You know, where even household names even people who you wouldn't think had a care in the world you know they struggle hmm. and the the most shocking one of those i ever heard was um tyson fury um he was on the joe rogan experience and he told a story about how he was driving one of his very expensive sports cars down a street, I think in LA, and was like, I just want to go and plow this into you know a pylon mm. or a par. And you think he's the world heavyweight champion of the world, he's minted, he's got his wife, he's got his entire family around him, but he was in such a horrific state that that's where he was, his mind was. And again, it, it needs people like him, and and you know, whether you love or hate him, you, you can't deny he's um. A voice for change. I mean, he's mm. he's got behind some incredible charities, and, and you know, has obviously spoken his mind. And to go on a platform such as Joe Rogan and tell a story like that, I mean, I I remember watching that episode, and you just see Joe's jaw just dropping more and mm. more as he's telling this story because you're looking at this mountain of a man that just 
exudes ego and, and strength. Yeah. And when you're walking, watching this man just break this story down, it, it, you don't know how to react to it. It's no. such a shocking thing. And, you know, going back to Frank Bruno, I mean, he was such an iconic boxer in, in the day. And so for him to to come out as 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 he did and, and explain where his mind is at. But again, I, I think it's one of those things of the people that you keep around you. You know, there are certain communities. And one thing I will say is throughout my my own personal struggles with my mental health, that the gaming community for the most part have been absolutely stunning. Um, yeah. People I don't even know who listen to this podcast or follow me on Twitch and stuff like that have reached out. And, you know, it was, it was quite the shock because I think the one thing with mental health is you do feel a little bit like you're the only one. Um, and you put yourself in this completely siloed hole that you don't think you can get out of. And, mm. and the moment you spark that I need help or I need support, the amount that you can potentially get back from completely unknown sources is is staggering. And um, I, I think when we, we look at the Frank Bruno example, I was very shocked that more people in the boxing industry didn't really rally around him and yeah you know another example that i saw recently was um of mike tyson yeah arguably one of the greatest if not the greatest of all time and he was telling a story about how you know his trainer would drill into him you know you're a killer that's all you know and Mm. he was telling this story and he's just streaming tears down his face because he said that's all i knew you know and He's had to undo all of this to become the person that he, I guess, was inside. But he was so scared of doing that because he thought other people were going to judge him for being a normal person. And when you think about that, it's insane to think that. But then when you've been drilled in such a way that your only job is to go out there and absolutely massacre people like he used to, I mean, it, it's, it's, testament, it's testament to his trainer, but again, the long-lasting effects. For him, at his age and in his fitness level, he's just a, an insane human being. To be so open and honest and to cry like he did and, and explain how much this emotional um, effect had ha- happened to him and his life, it, it was... It was shocking to see at first, but then you suddenly go, "He is human after all." Mm. You know? But it's like it, it's it's like the way that they do a lot of things in America. It's like Full Metal Jacket, yeah. one of the one of the best films ever, uh, in my opinion. Uh, quite disturbing, but you know, it's a brilliant film, and it's okay. just like the drill sergeant. Yeah, and it's like. It, it's it's removing somebody's humanity because you don't want them to be human. You want to be a cold, heartless killer. You don't exactly. want them to think twice before pulling the trigger. Hmm. And that's that's the kind of mentality that that kind of like seeps into so much uh, of society today. You know, you've hmm. got to. It's not just good enough to be good. You have to be the best. It's exactly. got to be on an ob- uh, obsessive level. And it's got to totally consume you. Mm. And then when you come out the other side, it's like, and you have time with your own thoughts. It's like, what have I done? Yeah. They say, was, it, was it I, worth it? You know, that's, that's, you see so many soldiers these days with like PTSD and mm. other, and other conditions from where they've suppressed so much. And then when they come out of the, uh, when they come out of the the military life, all of a sudden they have no they have no suppression. They have time with their thoughts, and it all comes spilling out, and that's that's horrific. That's absolutely horrific. I, you know, I it's, agree. but you know, <laughs> some might say that. Yeah, I say playing devil's advocate. Some might say that when you join the military, that that's what you open yourself up for. Hmm. That that's what you expect. I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to that to that thought. Um, I think that you know you've got to you've got to 
keep your humanity and you've got to you can't let yourself just turn into a into a robot which i, I, I agree and i which think which is you... which is what's so so <laughs> enthusiastically like drilled into us today mm. and i think the the interesting thing you mentioned there is that you know obviously people think of the military or the army as especially in america you know gun ho get a gun kill a thousand people job done which in recent history you could argue is their way but mm. you know the, the army is so much more you know they're peacekeepers they're humanitarians you know they, they build things you know that there's so much more to the military and i think you're right that there needs to be a an air of humanity in the approach um so yeah, that, that that that's totally right, and I think there there needs to be not just the, the education of drilling to be the best. You know, obviously everybody wants to be the best at what they do, but I think it's it's less focus on the quick journey to being the best, but concentrating on the journey, right? And hmm. I had this conversation with a friend of mine recently, and and I said to her, and again, I, I tell a lot of this to myself before I tell anyone else. The journey is the most important part because when you reach the goal, most people will forget the journey. They will just get to the goal and write off the journey, right? Yeah. But if people understand the journey of what it's taken, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's, for example, weight loss, a career goal, you know, the ideal job that you've always wanted, a sports car you've always wanted, because part of the problem is whatever you achieve, you'll just find another goal to go to. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't and it doesn't matter if you get your first car when you're sixteen or your first car when you're thirty-five, right? It's still gonna be your first car. The issue is, is you know, how long did it take you to get there? Did you have to save every penny? And it's a bit like when you used to buy games, you know, if you saved up your money to go to the shop to go and buy a game, you 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 cherish that game, you held on to it, but you know, if if it was just a throwaway game and you were like, yeah, whatever, you, you don't really care about it too much. Mm. And I, I think that's why I've always said that the journey is the most important part. It doesn't matter what you do. Because I myself, you know, I, I do Twitch streaming. I always thought, oh, you know, I'm going to get into retro. Everybody's going to love it. You know, everybody loves nostalgia and stuff like that. And to be fair, I, I've been very lucky. I have a, a select group of people who always turn up to my streams and I'm incredibly grateful for that. I have a, a wonderful set of mods who, who come to my stream and I'm incredibly thankful for them. But I got myself into a horrible situation where I was like, I'm not good enough. I'm not growing as quick as I want, blah, 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 blah. And I suddenly took a step back and went, is this actually the career I want? Is this mm. what I actually want to do? And I think if I said yes, maybe I would have taken a different approach and, and threw a bit more... I guess, commitment to it. But to be honest, I use it as a bit of a hobby and a bit of a laugh, you know, I now treat it as like a, a group of friends getting together, having a game. And if it's entertaining yeah. for people, great. if it's not, don't worry about it. And the one thing I've actually done recently is that any money that comes in, whether it's through Twitch or sales of merch, like this hat, um, or, <laughs> nice even, hat by the way. Or, or even like. this mug, which has my face <laughs> on it. Um, you know, all the money that I make from that, I, I give it to charity because, yeah. you know, I, I almost feel like, it, how can I, I'm, I don't want to make this sound disrespectful, but the money that I, I personally make through Twitch wouldn't sustain the living. No. Um, but but if I can give it to charity and it helps them pay for something, then it's it's done its job. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm giving it back to, to something good. Anyway, we've got 15 minutes. We have a yes. couple of questions to get through. As we yes, said, going we're, back. We're yes, <laughs> absolute, absolute 360, 180, however many Indeed. turns it took. But <laughs> saying getting your money's worth, because it, you know, you have to get most out of everything you can. Final Absolutely. Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII, about 500 hours probably into that game. Um, of course, the original. Not so much on the remake because, mm. you know, there's other games I've been playing and stuff like that. But One Winged Angel, one of the finest pieces of music ever crafted. And, yeah, I, I've still got that on my on my playlist even these days, whether it's the original version, the Black Mages version, the Final Fantasy remake version. Um, <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's, ju it's just... It, it's just perfect it's the perfect boss music it 
just absolutely incredible. Um, mm. But I, I love so much of the Final Fantasy music, uh, like um, Dancing Mad from Number Six. Mm. Uh, it's Kefka's final boss theme. Um, I, I just you got to look at um, some of the music from uh, from Zelda games as well. Absolutely incredible. Um, Mega Man Two, Wily's Castle. Um, Good choice. It was actually there was a, a vocal version of done uh, done of it by a uh, band called Jam Project, um, and it was. It, it's not about Mega Man at all. It's, right, it's okay. kind of got a story behind it. It's called it's called Okusen Man, <laughs> okay. and um, I'll I'll link it to you if I can find it again because okay. it's it takes that brilliant piece of and they kind of like make it into a kind of like a a rock kind of it's mm. absolutely amazing if you they've given it the one punch man treatment right Got um it. so it's it, it's it's fantastic um but yeah i mean just oh, so difficult to actually choose all the bits of music that I absolutely love, but I say anything Final Fantasy, uh, your Zelda music, stuff from Fallout, Skyrim. Um, even though I've never played the game, I've, there's so much amazing music in Halo. Um, yes. And just like all these, because it's becoming so much more cinematic these days. Some of the music in Elden Ring, absolutely incredible. God of War, yes. God of War, Ragnarok. I mean, you've... You just like everything it, it's about the whole package these days and music is so important because it sets the tone and it, it I, I gives agree. like this this constant background swell of setting what your emotions should be how you should react it because it's more about it's more than just what's happening on the screen it's like the full 360 um the whole package um but yeah, I mean, let's say when it comes to music, uh, obviously, I, you know, most of what I've done in my life has been related to music. And I just, mm. I just love to absolutely nerd out and spend like <laughs> half a day just listening to like up-to-date game music, retro game music, all through the ages, new arrangements and everything. And it, yeah, I just absolutely love it. Do you know what? One of my favorite remakes of a game and the music was um, Bio Bionic Commando Rearmed. And I I love the NES game, but the rearmed version, the music is just exceptional. And what's really peed me off is the music was on Spotify and then it yeah. got removed. And I tweeted the guy going, what the hell happened? And he was like, I don't know, Sony Music just decided to randomly pull the plug. And I'm like... It was an album. It was literally like a daily driver for me at work. Mm. And now I've got to go on YouTube to try and get it, which is incredibly frustrating. But the, the composition of how they took the original music and just gave it this electronica kick up the backside, <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's, it is true art. And I mean, the remake is fantastic and I, and I love it, but the music just adds that. Mwah, it's, it's that, it's that real piece, that cherry on top that's needed. And I think you're totally, agree, uh, totally right. When music is applied correctly to the right type of game, again, going back to another game that I can think of streets of rage four. I mean, yeah, Streets of Rage 2 has probably got one of the most iconic intro music that, that most people can can probably hum or, or remember. Streets of Rage 4, just playing that straight off the bat, the music was absolutely exceptional. And again, yeah. when you get that that tone right and you just nail it, it just again, it just sets that entire baseline. You know exactly what you're getting into off the bat. Mm. Which leads me into my final question. Would you ever get back into music if you were offered the chance to do music for games? Uh right. Well, a little bit of little bit of a pre pre answer to this <laughs> one. Um, the reason, the main reason why I'm no longer performing as a singer, um, I when I was in Pop Idol, obviously I had to drop out, and Darius took my place, um, and because I'd torn my vocal cords. Right. And for 
about four years after that, it was con- like a constant state of flux between being able to perform and not being able to perform. Right. Uh, when I got to about the age of 30, um, I was at the point where the the band I was with wasn't doing great. Um, we were earning money, but people wanted more um, than we were getting. And I was just like, my vocal performances were so wildly inconsistent. It's like one night I'd be all right. The next night I'd be like, my voice would just clip out and, you know, it, it would be like, it'd be like my voice was breaking. It'd be right, like a, I was a teenager again, where all of a sudden it just kind of like, Ugh, like that. He's, he's trying to be retro with his voice. Yeah. And I, you know, I, the most heartbreaking thing I ever had to do was say to myself, do you know what? I'm, I'm not willing to go out and give less than a hundred percent to anyone who watches me, whether they are there to enjoy me or whether they're there to take the mic. If I'm not on that stage giving absolutely a hundred percent quality, I don't want to do it. Hmm. Some people wouldn't even notice the difference, but I would. <laughs> no, and that's, that's why that's why I stopped. Hmm. And you know, it's you know, I'm I'm doing some local theatre. I'm doing some karaoke's and doing bits and pieces here and there. And I I enjoy it. Yeah, I still do. Um, I'm songwriting. Okay. Um, cool. I've been songwriting for about ten years, and nothing ever released. But you know, that's just me being me. Um, <laughs> everything I do these days is very personal. Um, a lot of the lyrics I write are very deep and, and quite dark. Um, maybe one day I'll, I'll feel, I'll feel comfortable to release it. Um, mm. But you never know. You never know. Things can, things can change. Um, if I could, if I could get back into like a group of people, really like accomplished musicians, people who I could feed my ideas to, and say, mm. right, okay, well, because I, I can't read music, I can't write music, I just know music. Music, yeah, sure. And if I could find a way to say, right, okay, this is, take that, put that there, this there, kind of like a minority report where he's just pulling stuff <laughs> out of nowhere and just like <laughs> twisting and stuff. Yeah, I'd, I'd be on that without, without a second's thought. There, there, would be no, there would be no thought process, it would just be yes. Hmm. because I'd, I'd say probably about 23 hours and 59 minutes of every day, I have music in my head. Even if I'm watching something, I've got this constant kind of like this little brain pod <laughs> at the back of my mind that's constantly playing another song and I'm kind of like singing along to it in my head whilst I'm watching TV kind of thing. I'm consumed and that's... I suppose in a way it's it's a bit of a blessing and a curse. Sure. Because it's so frustrating to not be in the position where I can where I can go out and 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 do it like I used to do it. No, sure. But at the I same can... at the same time I know that if there's something if there's something or someone who can unlock the gap between my brain and the music, then that's that's when I'm in my absolute element. Hmm. Okay. So on that note, where can we learn more about you then? Um, <laughs> Wikipedia. Um, although that says I'm born in 1982 and unfortunately yeah. I was born in 1981. So I'm going to be 42 <laughs> this year. So I'm a right oh. old git. Uh, yeah. as, as the beard, as the beard will show, I've kind of like gone for the Jack Black at the moment. So um, it's, uh, it's a tremendous beard you've got going on. Put, <laughs> I, I said I had the best beard on the internet, but I think you've uh, you've pitched me. Um, my fiance wants me to shave it off, and I keep on telling her no, and until until you know, maybe if I can get Jack Black to to tweet me, I'll shave it off. Um, so, so you're on you're on Twitter, are you? Um, not really, no. Okay. Yeah, but the only social media I do is Facebook, and I'm okay. really not. That's really kind of like close friends, family, stuff sure. like that. I, I, I do keep myself to myself quite a bit. Hmm. Um, I obviously I do stuff like this. I, I do like 
videos with other people and stuff. And, sure. you know, I've got my own Twitch channel that I haven't streamed on in about a long time. Um, it it's actually, it was my, it. it was my, it was my seventh anniversary uh, on the 27th. Oh, okay. So I was going to stream then. And then I was like, I think I got talking to you and I was like, I got too much in my own head a little bit. Sure. And we had, we had a good chat. But, hmm. you know, I, I I get too much in my own head and I think to myself, it's it's called imposter syndrome. Of course. Of course. I, <laughs> you I, always, you always I think... Have, I have experienced that. Yeah. Why, why on earth would anyone want to watch me? And it, it's, well, it's, that, it's, a, it's that thing. I it's can horrible. segue and say, for the same reason that people are watching me, is because I have awesome guests like you on it and that's why they watch. Oh, so, you're good. I, um, I was, like, certainly, I've been, I've, you know, I've been dropping into your Twitch streams and everything, and you know, it's been really enjoyable. And that's kind yeah. of like pulled me back towards. It's like just when I'm thinking that, they like, pull me back in. And, <laughs> you can blame me. You yeah, can blame me. I mean, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to play something some sometime. Just get we on there will. and, you know, Mate, it's, absolutely. it's one of those things oh, where it's like. Oh. I'll definitely link your uh, your your channel in the show notes, but um, you know, I, I think you should get back on it. I think, um, if anything, I think a lot of people will be very impressed by your knowledge of gaming first and foremost, and um, and obviously your approach to to life now. Uh, I think mm. the media have painted you in a very poor light, to say. Uh, in a polite way um and you know you, you're completely the polar opposite and um i i really hope that you do find a way back into music i think if anyone deserves i, I don't want to say a second chance but but for the best <laughs> be, best chances of using words I, I will but i think if anyone deserves a chance to go back into music to to do something that they love and, and hold dear it is definitely yourself but um th thank you so so much it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you i would never have thought all those years ago watching you on tv i'd be <laughs> talking to you 10 or 15 years later but then be I could, the way I can, it's happened so. i can talk for england uh, you you could have easily fitted you, you could filled like six hours on here and you know we did we did get off off topic a lot and i feel really bad but you know obviously you've had loads of questions ready for me and we haven't right, really no got around to answering them but You're but fine. we will we will we will answer all those questions at some point we certainly will. I. Uh, who knows? Maybe. Maybe you'll be another returning guest at some. Point. But, um, no. Thank you so so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And as I said, um, his Twitch details or any other details will be linked down below. So make sure you go and give him a follow. And I will make him stream. I promise. Yes. Um, but from me, me Machine Dean, and uh, from Rick again, thank you so so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Me Machine Dean. Signing out. You can wait. See you later. later. Bye. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Hi there, Dean here. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Make sure you add this podcast to your favourites on whichever podcasting platform you use and give it a positive review. Until next time, me Machine Dean, signing out. <laughs>